Should I just get going? Sure. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we commit the words of our study today. Um, we, su we submit them to you. We ask you to bless them ahead of time, uh, both in their delivery and in their reception. Please let our hearts um, be fertile soil for your words um, from, spoken from our Council Fathers in the Second Vatican Council. Grant us the wisdom that comes from these documents, the ability to communicate this gospel to others, that they might be part of the exact thing that we are studying, which is the Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, I'm I can't change my view. That's okay. I'll just leave it like that. I'm going to be looking off to the side where my notes are. So please pardon me if it doesn't look like I'm speaking uh, to you. So we are studying Lumen Gentium. I've been asked to uh, present the first chapter of Lumen Gentium. Uh, this is the uh, one of the do dogmatic um, documents from the Second Vatican Council. If anybody ever says that the Second Vatican Council was not dogmatic in any of its documents. Uh, there are three, and this is one of the three. It's Lumen Gentium uh, is one. The, another is De Verbum, and the third one is, um, I'm forgetting right now. So your homework is to look it up because I forget. Lumen Gentium may be the one that's played the most significant role in defining the nature and mission of the Catholic Church in contemporary times. And it has a has had a pretty monumental impact in general on ecclesiology. So when we say ecclesiology, it means the study of the church. We are the ecclesia, that is the Greek word for the assembly. That's how um, the Bible refers to the church. It calls it the assembly, the assembly of believers. So this document is talking about this assembly of believers and therefore has an impact on our ecclesiology, both in thought, preaching, and uh, in the writings of the four post-conciliar popes. Post-conciliar meaning after the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI, John Paul I and II, uh, and Benedict XVI, all of whom participated in the council. And I should add actually five because I can definitely see, um, uh, since my notes on this are a little old, um, the, uh, the current pontiff, uh, Francis, has also uh, used this understanding of the church in, in his uh, modus operandi as pope. The essay um, is composed, uh, and since I'm the first one speaking on this, I'm going to give you a little bit of this general overview, right? So I'm doing chapter one, which is the mystery of the church. Um, but we're also looking uh, at other aspects of being the light to the nations. That's what Lumen Gentium means, the light of the nations or to the nations. So we have, uh, first of all, the, the, the first chapter, which kind of lays the groundwork on the mystery of the church. Then it leads into the people of God, which is the second chapter. The third on the hierarchical structure of the church, um, particularly uh, regarding bishops. The fourth is about the laity. The fifth on the universal call to holiness in the church, meaning that it's not just the priests, the deacons, and the religious brothers and sisters who are called to be holy. We are all called to be holy in the church, uh, combating an ancient misunderstanding that pervades the church from age to age. The sixth is on the religious, uh, those called into religious life. The seventh on the ecclesia, excuse me, the eschatological nature of the church, meaning uh, eschatological meaning, it's ordered to the end times, right? What is the end, the nature of the church as a pilgrim church toward the consummation of the kingdom of God 
So think of end times when you think of eschatological. Um, and then finally, it ends with a very well-placed chapter on the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, in the mystery of the church, um, in the mystery of Christ and the church. And this is an interesting chapter simply because it was argued that Mary should have her own document, that she should not be in the document with the church. However, um, in the wisdom of the fathers, uh, not that I should agree or disagree uh, one way or the other on this chapter, but I think it, it makes so much sense for our Blessed Mother to be highlighted and the capstone of this document being the first disciple, the model of the church and our mother in a union with Christ and that she is included in this document and not separated from it. Okay, that's the general overview of the, the entirety of Lumen, uh, excuse me, yeah, of Lumen Gentium. And so let's go now into the uh, first chapter. This is the mystery of Christ, and, and the, the first line of Lumen Gentium is uh, just that, Lumen Gentium cum sit Christus. Lumen Gentium cum sit Christus. Uh, it's usually is translated as Christ is the light of nat nations, um, but it's really a causal statement. It's since Christ is the light of nations. Uh, some translations have it, Christ is the light of nations, and because of this, the sacred synod gathers together. So um, it's really causal. So because Christ is the light of nations, the synod wants to make some say statements, and these are the statements it wants to make on um, on the church. And so the council eagerly desired to proclaim the gospel again in a renewed, vigorous way, not in a changed, uh, not with a change to its essence, but in a change to its, um, in how we communicate to the world around us. Um, this, um, this gospel is light. It is brightly visible on the countenance of the church. This is a very interesting opening uh, set of lines here. So the gospel, which is to be proclaimed to every creature, is a light brightly visible on the countenance of the church. Think of yourself there. Is the gospel brightly visible on your face? Is, you know, you think of um, Pope Francis's document uh, um, um, Evangel Evangelium Gaudii, the joy of the gospel. That should be emanating from us as the council fathers imagine it in the emanating from the church. And that is because Christ, the church being in Christ is like a sacrament. It is like a sign and instrument, both of a very closely knit union with God and of the unity of the whole human race. So what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a sign that actually communicates the grace that it represents. And it is an encounter with Christ himself. The Council Fathers very clearly here um, teaching that the church is an encounter with Jesus Christ. Um, we are meant to be that encounter. And so it wants to unfold this gospel more fully um, to the church itself, to the faithful in the church, and to the whole world, namely the inner nature and the universal mission we have. We want to um, follow faithfully the teaching of previous councils, so they're not, again, they're not reinvent, they're not changing, they're not, they're not contradicting anything that came before it. They want to follow faithfully those previous teachings. And um, they want to do this because the society itself is joined more closely by social, technical, and cultural ties. And it's so interesting. This was written at a time when a lot of our communication and social technologies were just um, advancing and developing. And nowadays, can you imagine how much ex more exponentially we are tied to one another socially? So even more so, we capitalize um, in our modern world to, um, to 
to use what has been given to us technologically um, to communicate the truth of the gospel to the world. In section two, you have the beginnings of the pretty much a very straightforward explanation of the gospel. One of the things I struggled with as I prepared this doctrinal royo was that um, it's almost like I could, couldn't add all that much to what I'm reading here. This is, this is such an explanatory document in and of itself. If you read this first chapter from end to end, I'd have to ask you what questions you had um, that need to be answered. And maybe, maybe that's the best way to, to, to proceed. But it's, it's, it breaks everything down in such a systematic way, in such a plain way, using scripture particularly. Scripture is replete in this first chapter if you look at the footnotes. It is taking all of those elements of scripture that describe the church and the relationship of the church to Christ and to one another and, and putting them together in a way that explains um, what we are to, to ourselves. And I think it does a very good job of that. So what, what you have there in, chap, in, um, in, in uh, the second paragraph or the second section is the beginning of a, of a very plain gospel explanation. The eternal father by a free and hidden plan of his own wisdom and goodness created the whole Excuse me, Deacon, you, you ended up muting yourself by accident. <laughs> How did I do that? Okay, so the eternal father, by a free and hidden plan of his own wisdom and goodness, created the whole world. His plan was to raise men to a participation of the divine life. That's something we need to remind ourselves of. We are called to a participation of the divine life. And that is what the church comes to bring us, is that participation in the divine life. Now, I'm not going to reiterate this gospel message. You should know this God or begin to know this gospel message this well. This is such a great presentation of the gospel message of our fall and us um, being foreknown by God, being predestined by God to become conformed to the image of his son. That his son was, was not something in time but an eternal plan that he knew from the beginning. And you see this, this timeless nature of the Christ figure and even the plan of the church. So already from the beginning of the world, the foreshadowing of the church took place. This, was, this wasn't something that God um, had to invent along the way. This wasn't something where God created man and then we blew it and he said, oh, now I got to come up with something else. That's not how it worked. He knew from the instant of creation all that was needed for this plan. He knew about the fall. He knew about the need for redemption. He knew about his desire for us to participate in the divine life. And therefore, in that instant, it was all there in his heart. And so were we. Uh, this explanation goes on to say that, um, you know, it looks forward to the end. We talked about that eschatology. We're looking forward to the end of time where we will, as the church, gloriously achieve our, the completion of the Father's plan. And then it continues with this gospel message in uh, the third section. So we have the setting of the creation, uh, God's foreknowledge, God's plan. And then chapter three focuses in on the son's part in that plan. The son therefore came, sent by the father in him before the foundation of the world that the father chose us and predestined us to become adopted sons. Um, this goes on to quote uh, from various uh, sources of, of scripture and the ones I want to highlight here are um, uh, John 19, uh, which is marked in footnote five, this inauguration and this growth are both symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side 
of the crucified Christ. So not a direct quote, but referencing, of course, John 19, where Jesus is stabbed in the side and blood and water flows out. I always liked this image. So uh, the gospel message begins with the creation story, right? And we know in creation that uh, we have Adam and from the side of Adam, Eve is brought forth when God opens his side and, and uh, takes his rib and creates the woman. Here we have the new Adam, Jesus Christ, crucified. He is, he is his side, Jesus' side as the new Adam is opened. It is pierced by the lance, blood and water flow out. And it is by this blood and water that the church becomes the new Eve. The blood and water being, of course, the Eucharist, uh, well, in proper order, baptism, water, and blood, the Eucharist. It is through our baptism and the Eucharist that we are made sanctified as the, we are sanctified as the church. And it is as often as the sacrifice of the cross in which Christ our Passover was sacrificed is celebrated on the altar, the work of our redemption is carried on. And in the sacrament of the Eucharistic bread, the unity of all believers who form one body in Christ is both expressed and brought about. This is so crucial that the Eucharist isn't something we just kind of um, observe. It is not something that we sit simply in awe of. The Eucharist um, being a sacrament isn't just limited to the fact that the sacrament does um, communicates the grace um, which it symbolizes, right? So it's not just that the priest that, uh, you know, says the words and it becomes the body and blood of Christ. That sacrament goes beyond just the consecration. It goes into the life of the person receiving it. The grace extends to build the unity of all believers. It goes into the person's life in order to produce the growth that is symbolized by the dying of the seed and the grinding of it into, in, into our lives. And so all men, therefore, are called to this union with Christ. I like this statement uh, because it, it's, it's, it's reminding the church that though we have ecumenical efforts um, and though we have interreligious efforts, this is the only religion designed by God. God reaches down to us in the sacraments through the Catholic Church. It is not equal to any other religion, or I should say no other religion is equal to it because it is the one that God has established even though there may be elements in other religions that are maybe true, noble, and good, um, there, is no, there is no equivalence. And so this is the first hint um, in which Lumen Gentium uh, reminds us that uh, this is the union, this is the church, this is the religion to which all men are called, particularly participation in the Eucharist through baptism. You'll see echoes of this throughout uh, the rest of the document. And I refer you to a document called Dominus Jesus, or the Lord Jesus. It is written uh, by then Cardinal Ratzinger and promulgated um, through the um, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under po Pope John Paul II in which she takes this particular theme of um, salvation only through the church and reminds uh, the church what Lumen Gentium uh, taught. And that is that there is no other savior other than Jesus Christ. And there is no other way to heaven through, except through his church. Even if it means, even if the person is imperfectly joined to the church, even if they are of another religion, but the grace of God flows to them. It flows to them for salvation through the church. So I refer you to Dominus Jesus. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, so we're in um, section four. I'm only halfway through. Okay, so we're gonna have to speed it up here. 
So um, section four talks about the role of the spirit then, right? So we started out with the gospel message beginning with the father and creation and his divine plan. So chapter three focused on the son and the action of the son and now the action of the spirit who was sent on the day of Pentecost in order that we might, that Christ might continually sanctify the church. The spirit which guides the church into all truth um and this is important this is um this is a promise from jesus in the gospels that uh all truth would be made known to us john 16 13 that means that it was a something that would develop over time that truth um, in the deposit of faith was contained in a seed form that seed would continue to grow and develop and the church would continue to develop doctrine around the revelation over time. And so we believe as Catholics in the development of doctrine and the affirmation and the work of the Holy Spirit through the councils of the church and the popes of the church in order to elucidate um, what natural growth and what the natural growth of those truths are. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move ahead simply because of time and there's there's some reverberations uh, that I think I'll catch some of these actions of the Holy Spirit it, because it talks about how the Holy Spirit makes us um, brings us into union with Christ our spouse the church being the new Eve means that we are the bride of Christ and the spirit um, the spirit enables us to be that bride of Christ and he is our bridegroom. So the mystery of the church in section five is manifest in its very foundation. It's manifest in its very foundation. The Lord Jesus set it on its course by preaching the good news. So um, uh, from the beginning of Christ's preaching, the church was, again, part of the plan and the mystery of that church is revealed through that preaching when he says that the kingdom of god has come upon you uh, it was promised for centuries through the scriptures and then when the time was fulfilled for christ to come what was his message the kingdom of god is at hand uh, that kingdom of god is not a future reality uh, reality because it is a reality in Christ himself. If Christ is the king of the kingdom, that means the kingdom is present. And he pretty much says that in his preaching, especially when he's accused of casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. And he said, and he said um, you know, you say I cast it out because of, of the devil, um, but in reality, it, um, I cast them out by the finger of God. And if I cast them out by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So through his miracles, even, he speaks of how the, how the kingdom of God is already upon them in his presence. And so, uh, so section five makes that statement that the kingdom is clearly visible in the very person of Christ himself. The son of God and son of man uh, who came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That title, son of man, uh, we should all know that title, son of man. You hear Jesus use it all the time in the Gospels. Um, when you hear son of man, Jesus is alluding to his fulfillment of the prophecies of the book of Daniel. That Jesus is the one um, who was promised by that great prophet. And if you've never read the book of Daniel and its prophecies, uh, take some time to do that somewhere along the line. Do a study in Daniel and appreciate what it means for Jesus to call himself, his favorite title, by the way, the Son of Man. So it is from the source of the Holy Spirit, then, that the church is equipped with the gifts of its founder. And faithfully guarding his precepts. So what are these precepts? Charity, humility, and self-sacrifice. 
these three are outlined here. This is what Jesus, the founder, um, uh, pre presents as his precepts, charity, humility, and self-sacrifice. Um, and by this, the church receives the mission to proclaim and spread among all peoples the kingdom. This is how we do it. We don't do it um, through might. We don't, we don't do it through imposition. We don't do it um, in any other way but charity, humility, and self-sacrifice. This is what wins souls to the gospel. The church then, therefore strains toward the completed kingdom with all its strengths, hopes, and desires in order to be united in glory with its king. That is our only desire, that in all of our efforts, in the end, we will receive what was promised by Christ, and that is unity in glory. Uh, in the glory of heaven. In section six, the church is the sheepfold whose um, one in the indispensable door is Christ. So six begins to refer to the Old Testament revelation of the kingdom um, and brings us to the New Testament uh, metaphors as well. So you have Old Testament metaphors and New Testament metaphors. And the particular one I want to focus in here is on the sheepfold and the indispensable door being Christ. Again, a reference to the document, well, not to the document, but Dominus Jesus uh, refers back to these, right? This is the only gate. This is the only door. Christ is the only way. And if you want to be in the sheepfold, you must come through Christ. It is a flock of which God himself foretold he would be the shepherd and whose sheep although ruled by human shepherds, are nevertheless continually led and nourished by Christ himself. So now you start to see the document transition to the hierarchy of the church. We're talking about the sheep and the sheepfold, but we're talking about how this good shepherd, Jesus Christ, shepherds his sheep to other human shepherds. Uh, it turns its attention uh, to one of Paul's uh, letters, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, in footnote 31 there, um, in section 6. And it talks about how our roots are in the old olive tree of Israel, uh, which uh, are the prophets and the patriarchs. And it says, um, in which the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles has been brought about and will, and will be brought about. This is prophesied many times uh, in the Old Testament, that the Jews and Gentiles would be reconciled, uh, Gentiles being non-Jews. So you have the people of God and the people who are not the people of God becoming um, reconciled as the people of God. And this is very important to Paul's gospel. Uh, not that Paul wrote a gospel of Paul, but when Paul preaches the gospel, this is a very, very key element, that the Jews and the non-Jews are now one. They are two walls joined together and built on a cornerstone, which holds them together. This is the church, and this is the building of God. And for him, if you were to try to separate those two again, you were not preaching the gospel. Uh, so it's very clear from Paul. It is a, it's an essential element in his, his preaching that you will see over and over. Um, I'm going to skip some of these images, uh, which are very popular that you, you are aware of about the building of God and us being living stones and us being the holy city. Um, you know, if you read the book of Revelation, that, that holy city, the new Jerusalem, that's us. We are the new Jerusalem born out of the Old and the New Testament um, Jew, Jewish um, believers. Right before the uh, section seven begins, you see this conclusive statement in section six. The church while on earth journeys in a foreign land away from the Lord. It is a life in exile. It seeks and experiences those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, where the life of the church is hidden. The life of the church is hidden with Christ in God until it appears in glory with its spouse. 
this is so important for us. Um, it, it, and it sometimes it seems a little, very little consolation, but uh, we have to be, we have to be content to know that we are in exile. This is not our home. The church was not meant um, to jive with uh, the fallen world around us. Um, the church was meant for heaven. It is meant to prepare people and bring people into the kingdom of heaven while on earth. But our life is hidden with Christ. That's part of the mystery. Our consolation, our, the wiping away of all, all our tears and sorrows does not necessarily happen in this life. But it will be when he appears in glory um, and we are revealed, we are revealed in the end of time as the spouse of Christ. So we have to have that patience. We have to have that trust and that hope in this mystery. And that as we endure our life of exile and our life of and joining in his sufferings here on earth. All right, I'm going to try and wrap up sections six and seven here as quickly as possible, or seven and eight as quickly as possible. Um, so in section seven, uh, it talks about our union with the Son of God and in the body. And in that body, the life of Christ is poured into the believers who, through the sacraments, are united in a hidden and real way. A hidden, again, this mystery. We have to be content with mystery. Um, a hidden and real way to Christ who suffered and was glorified. And that life comes to us through the sacraments. Through those sacraments, we are ontologically joined to Christ. We are united to Christ, ontologically meaning in a real way. Even if we don't have scientific language to describe it, or if we can't see it under a microscope, it is a spiritual reality that cannot be um, disputed. And we get this beginning in baptism, as, as this quotes from um, the book of Romans, for we are buried with him by means of baptism into death. Or excuse me, Corinthians, first Corinthians. Um, no, I'm right, Romans. Yeah, we are buried with him by means of baptism into death. If we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection also. When you are baptized, we must remember that something really happens there. And it, it, yes, it's the, the washing away of original sin and all sins that we may have been may have committed. But and it's 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 an appeal to God in clear conscience. Yes, but it's a death. It's it's a participation in the death of Christ as if we had died with Him, as if we were other Christ's able to die for our sins. He gives us the privilege of a vicarious death, as if we were the sacrifice. We have entered into that death through baptism, and because we have died with him, we have the right and the privilege of rising with him, even though we didn't earn it. It is a total grace. It's a total gift. And so we really partake in the body of the Lord um, through baptism and through the Eucharistic bread, where it takes on an even deeper meaning of communion. And that's nuptial. That means we're married to Christ. Every time we take that bread, we are saying we are one body. We are one flesh with Christ. And by this Christ, we have access to the kingdom of heaven. It turns its attention again towards the apostles and the authority of the church in section seven, where it says, "What has a uh, what has a special place among the gifts to the to the church is the grace of apostles, to those to whose authority the Spirit Himself subjected even those who were endowed with charisms." This is so important. So there are many gifts in the church, and some had greater gifts than others. 
but even those who had maybe some of the more ostensible and miraculous gifts, they were still subject to the authority of the apostles whose gifts or the bishops whose gifts uh, may have been limited to their authority to be shepherds. Um, so we all owe obedience to Christ through these shepherds, which gives the body unity. It is, it is an essential part of Christ being the head of the church. It is through his, um, his being the head that he shares his authority with um, the bishops, and it is through the bishops that we remain united as the body to the head of Christ. So on earth, still as pilgrims in a strange land, again referring to our exile, tracing our trials in oppression, the paths that Jesus trod, we are made one with his sufferings, like the body is one with the head, suffering with him, that we may be glorified with him. So this reiteration that together with the shepherds of the church, we become pilgrims and we share in his sufferings in order that we might be like him and glorified in heaven. I'm going to have to skip ahead here. I want to uh, finish with um, section eight on the one mediator. So it comes down to um, this statement, uh, first statement of section eight, Christ the one mediator established and continually sustains here on earth his holy church. This statement is usually used against us because it comes right from, um, I think it's, uh, gosh, I think it's Colossians or is it um, Ephesians? Might be Ephesians. No. Um, all right, I have to look that one up again. So there is one mediator between God and man, the scriptures say. Um, that one mediator is Jesus Christ. Does that mean there are not other mediators or intermediators? And the answer is, as we believe, that just because Christ is the one mediator doesn't mean that the sacraments through the hands of the priests uh, and the bishops, and in some cases, uh, the deacons for baptism or, or for marriage, those sacraments can come through other mediators. It's not that we are different mediators. It's just that Jesus, as the one mediator, chooses to share his, um, his role as mediator with the members of his body, primarily the shepherds of the church. So the hierarchical organs of the mystical body of Christ, um, they're not two realities. Um, the visible assembly and the spiritual community of the church. They're not two realities. The church is a visible reality with a visible structure in the world. This is something that some many Christians don't believe. They don't, they, or they separate the two. They say, well, the hierarchy is one thing and the real church is another thing, or the rest of the church is another thing. By no means, it's all one body and it's a visible body that can be seen. Um, so it is no weak analogy uh, that uh, this document compares the mystery of, uh, of the church to the incarnate word itself as a sacrament. And this is the one church, which our Savior, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter to be shepherd. And what, what does this church do with Peter at the helm, with um, Christ as the head in heaven, sharing his authority with Peter and the apostles and the bishops who succeed them on earth and down to us as um, the, the faithful of the church. We are the pillar and mainstay of the truth. Altogether, we are the pillar and the bulwark or the mainstay of the truth. It's not the scripture alone that is the pillar and mainstay of the truth. It is not um, the bishops alone who are the pillar and mainstay of the truth. It is the entire church in tradition and in written scripture, in shepherds and in laity that are the, the structure, the supporting structure of truth in this world. Even if some of those elements of truth can be found elsewhere in other religions, even competing religions, if it's true, it's true. And 
that truth belongs first and foremost foremost to the church. If they exist outside the church, they exist to impel people, to compel people to the truth of the Catholic Church. And finally, the church turns its attention, therefore, to all people, especially sinners, especially the poor, especially those in the margins, because in embracing them, they embrace Christ, who also embraced sinners, and called them to be holy, always in need of being purified. And that is what the church exists to do, to continually purify souls. By the power of the risen Lord, it is given strength that it might, in patience and love, overcome its sorrows and its challenges, both within itself and outside of itself. And that, so that we might reveal to the world faithfully, even if sometimes imperfectly or darkly, the mystery of the Lord until in the end it will be manifested in full light. And so those are the actual concluding words of section eight of chapter one and basically the groundwork for Lumen Gentium. Um, I'm going to just leave it up to time at this point and turn it back over to uh, Robbie.